Well, last week I rattled on for a few minutes, probably 10 minutes or so, kind of doing an introduction to Nehemiah chapter 5, uh, which was uh, just kind of a, an overview of what we were going to get into in Nehemiah 5, plus I also mentioned a few backdrop things uh, catching up on Nehemiah 1 through 4, so I'm not going to do that again. Those of you that uh, aren't always here, uh, are all most of you aware of that all of these studies are on a YouTube channel, and do you have the link to the YouTube channel? I know everyone, most everybody's face in here that I, I recognize, and I've emailed probably all the men in our fellowship at one point or another with those hyperlinks uh, to a YouTube channel, so you can go back to all the different studies that we've done and um, listen to those past teachings. It may take, a, like last week's study may not be up there yet because it takes a little while for Matt Starkey to fit certain things into his schedule to upload them and so forth. Uh, but most of them, or I think almost every one of them, except where we may have had uh, uh, audio or video technical difficulties, uh, have been uploaded. So I talked to Matt, I think, two weeks ago, and he was current as of two weeks ago. So that was good. I'll probably be sending another email soon. Just, uh, you know, I try to do that anyway every couple of months just so that way everyone has a, a current email that they can keep in their inbox somewhere and get to these, because you can, not just for you, but you may want to send it to somebody else, share it with somebody, as maybe a, a nice invite, uh, like Pastor David was talking about recently, uh, sharing, you know, this might be easier for one of your uh, buddies to come to than on a Thursday night or a Sunday morning. It may be a little, nice little introduction uh, to what uh, the bridge is all about. Um, so think about that as how you can maybe share uh, the bridge with somebody uh, through the, the men's Bible study links. All right, so just a short recap. Uh, before we jump into Nehemiah 5, and we're going to start in verse 9 once I do um, start going expositionally through the chapter once again. But I'd like to ask a question. Who, apl who applauds the loudest when a church splits? Who, the devil, are, and basically uh, unbelievers. So unbelievers, we have a few of those in Nehemiah. Uh, you know, they've been causing trouble um, up until this chapter 5 where we don't hear much from them, but the damage has kind of already been done uh, that these um, troublemakers, these unbelievers, have, have done around the, the walls of Jerusalem. So who applauds the loudest when a church splits? Uh, unbelievers or the enemy, the devil, it, were all good answers. Uh, what they might say is something like this. When they hear about a church split, the, the unbelievers may say, yeah, I knew that would happen someday. Uh, these Christians, they can preach love all day long, but they just, they just don't know how to do it. Uh, how many people have heard anything similar to that? Maybe in just a, different words and so forth, but we've probably all had unbelieving friends at some point in time. Um, and either it was a, our witness, good or bad, uh, that maybe led them to say that. Uh, so think about that when there's dissension, division going on in a church fellowship, whether it's here or somewhere else, or it's in the news, or on the radio, in the newspaper. Um, just be aware that there's people applauding when that happens, unfortunately. Uh, and are you going to stand in the gap? Uh, I have just happened to think of that phrase that Pastor David again used recently. Uh, we could stand in the gap if we hear somebody complaining about a church split or something divisive going on in a fellowship. Uh, we should be wanting to stand in the gap and explain yeah, that, that happens. Nobody, we're not perfect at the bridge. Um, any church you go to, you're not going to find a perfect church. As Pastor David would say, if, if, if you did find, find that church, you wouldn't be welcome because you're not perfect. Uh, that may put a smirk on their face, but I'm sure they'll kind of get over it and realize that nobody is perfect except Jesus. So just remember that. We can stand in the gap sometimes. This is a sad but true statement, but the unbelievers applaud when there's a church split or division in the church. And we see that happening. The reason I brought that question up is because that's what's happening kind of in Jerusalem right now. Uh, and, and Nehemiah is trying to stand in the gap. He's trying to uh, um, squash uh, the division that's going on. So Nehemiah, Nehemiah wanted to make sure if these thoughts were starting to ruminate outside the walls of Jerusalem because of what happened or was happening inside the walls, he wanted to be the one to bring these ruminations to an end. He wanted to be the one to squash uh, the sayings, the things that were being talked about uh, 
inside the walls. He wanted, if that was happening outside the walls, he wanted to be the one to correct it inside, and then that way the word would spread, and then the Tobias and the Sandballots wouldn't have any more reason to celebrate uh, or to applaud at what was going on inside the walls. Because, again, last week we talked about the financial crisis in the land. I mentioned last week if you wanted to break up this chapter into three different sections, verses 1 through 5 would be talking about the, the financial crisis in the land. Remember how we talked about the rulers and the nobles? The richer Israelites were actually um, charge, lending money with interest to their fellow brethren. And we talked about how lending money was okay, Israelite to Israelite, but the caveat was you were not supposed to charge interest, and that's what they were doing. So that's the financial crisis in the land. The, the poorer people were having to sell their land, sell their houses, sell their vineyards, sell their crops just to buy food for their families. Some of them had big families, and they just could not provide without starting to sell things. Uh, and then there was another group of people that were mortgaging off um, their lands and their vineyards and so forth, and then there was others that were borrowing money. Uh, that was the last resort to actually borrow more money rather than just selling their assets. They were borrowing more money, um, and, and that was not good either. Um, so, and then verses 6 through 7, were two little verses there, where Nehemiah, uh, his reaction to the financial crisis. So he re got really perturbed. Remember, he got really angry. And we talked about how his anger was what we'd call a righteous indignation. Uh, it was a holy anger. And then how he had that serious thought where he really talked to himself. He really contemplated with his heart uh, before he started to discuss with the rulers and the nobles. And if, re if you remember, he uh, first met kneecap to kneecap, face to face with the rulers and nobles, confronted them. He rebuked them, essentially. And then immediately after that, he took those same nobles and rulers and he pulled them in front of a, an assembly, a congregation, a group of other people. So he rebuked them personally and then in a group setting. Uh, and again, we'll find that same type of um, proper rebuking technique, I guess if you want to call it something like that, uh, in Matthew 18. So that you could write that down and take notes and kind of read that chapter a little bit later. Um, and then today, tonight, we're going to follow up, finish the chapter, and verses 8 through 19 uh, point out the loving solution to all of this. So we had the financial crisis, the leader's reaction to the financial crisis, and now we're going to come up with the loving solution to it all. Uh, Nehemiah playing the key role. And remember, verse 8 is where we ended last week, and that was pretty much where Nehemiah did the mic drop. Said what he said, and then... What was the reaction? We're, we're going to read a little bit about that tonight, but the rulers and the nobles, they said, yes, you are right, Nehemiah. We were wrong. Um, and then they agreed to do, they're going to agree to do what he suggested that they do. So, <clears throat> with that said, let's jump into, well, I had this one little graphic here. I just wanted to, re I, I'd shown this once before, quite a while ago, but uh, this is how the Old Testament and New Testament books of the Bible kind of stack up if you wanted to separate them all into their own little books and put them on a bookshelf. We've got these different categories, uh, topics, uh, you, you could say, how the Old Testament is broken up into the law, the history, poetry, uh, major prophets and minor prophets, and then the New Testament, again, those categories there. Um, so here in Nehemiah, we see it there in the history books, starting off with Joshua, ending in Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. All right, so a nice little graphic just to kind of get you, put your, wrap your mind around all. How many books in the Bible? 66 books in the Bible written by how many different authors? About 40 different authors making up these 66 different books. How many books in the Old Testament? Can you count them real quick? 39. That means 27 in the, in the New. Just some little trivia questions to have on the tip of your tongue so if somebody asks you 39 27 number of books in the old and new testament respectively all right nehemiah chapter 5 verse 9 then i said what you are doing is not good this is nehemiah speaking should you not walk in the fear of our god because of the reproach 
of the nations, our enemies. So these surrounding nations, uh, their enemies. I think Nehemiah here is trying to remind the people of what has happened to them in the past and how the surrounding enemy nations had taken them captive because of their not fearing the Lord and their following the Lord. They didn't fear the Lord properly, as they should, and also they weren't following the Lord's commandments and statutes as they should. Um, many other teachings have been done about you know, why they were sent into captivity captured by Assyria, the northern kingdom, and, and then several years later, um, well, actually 200-ish years, 150 years later, uh, the southern kingdom uh, captured by Babylonians and taken to Bab Babylon for 70 years. That 70 years is a unique number. Again, that's a separate teaching. We'll, I'll let you dig into that if, uh, if you're not sure where that number comes from. But they weren't following the Lord's commandments and statutes for many 490-ish years up until this point and why they were sent away into captivity for 70 years. And then, you know, through, through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we have the returning exiles uh, making their way back to Jerusalem. Um, and again, that book, that whole study through the book of Ezra is on the YouTube channel. And uh, we're, we already made our way all the way through that book and then through chapter 5 now of Nehemiah. So when Nehemiah commented on them not walking in the fear of the Lord, he was essentially saying that the enemies like Tobiah and Sanballat are outside the walls of Jerusalem laughing at what is going on inside the walls of Jerusalem. They are loving the fact that the Israelites are treating each other so poorly. So when we see or when there is this type of abuse of other people, meaning the richer Israelites taking advantage of the poorer Israelites, there is no fear of God in these wrongdoers. But remember, these wrongdoers that we're talking about are Israelites. They're supposed to fear God, and they had kind of got separated from what they should be doing. They were almost doing things just right. Remember with the lending of money? They knew that they could lend money to their brethren. They just took it one extra wrong step further by charging interest when they lended that money to their brethren. Remember the other thing we talked about last week? was some of the, the poor Israelites, they were actually selling some of their children so that way they could earn more money from their children's labor with the richer Israelites. So that was also something that was allowed in Jewish community was to kind of sell your labors, sell your children just for the labor, but they weren't, so they could do that. So it kind of sounds bad or sounds weird, but when that owner of that sold person they were not supposed to treat the person that they purchased, essentially, as a slave. So they were still supposed to be their master, per se, but not treat them as a bad as a slave might be treated, uh, like a foreigner that was also in bondage. So that was just for a season also. It was just for a time frame. The year of Jubilee, all of those people that had sold themselves to be under bondage, they were supposed to be released back to their family. Uh, free of charge at that point, but they had earned an income during that time of being in bondage. So that was, again, something that they had taken to the extreme. These rich Israelites were actually not just having the people that they purchased in bondage, but they were really treating them bad. They are treating them as slaves, and they shouldn't have been. So the wrongdoers had lost a little bit of the fear of the Lord that Nehemiah reminds them that they should never lose that fear of the Lord. So if you act like the world, there is no light and there is no positive testimony to be shown to our enemies. So if we start acting like the world is already acting and doing the things that the world is already doing, how is our positive, good light supposed to shine through? Essentially, if we're doing what the world is already doing, how are we any different? We're not. That's the point. We need to be different than what the world is already doing to be able to show and have a good, positive, reinforcing, loving testimony. And again, the richer rulers had lost that power of the testimony because they weren't doing the things that they were supposed to be doing and having a fear of the Lord. They weren't following his guide, guidance, his commandments, and his statutes. So that's what Nehemiah is pointing out here in verse 9. He's just kind of asking them some questions, trying to make them go, hmm, maybe I'm not doing things quite exactly the way I should have been doing, is what he's trying to make them think. 
So verse 10. I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please, let us stop this usury. When I first read this, I, I was surprised because I, I, I can't see any way around this unless there's something different in the grammar that I'm not picking up on when I read it in a couple different versions that he's admitting, Nehemiah is admitting here, that he also was charging interest, lending them, well, I guess he didn't say he was charging them interest. He said he was lending them money. That's the, that's the yeah, that's the difference. Um, I, I wanted to make, point that out, but he was lending them money, and, but it doesn't say with interest. So he was kind of doing, he was doing exactly what was allowed. Um, so, uh, yeah, that is the main difference. Um, so let's, let us please stop this usury. But here he says, let us stop this usury. But it, and usury, by definition, typically is lending with interest. So I was conflicted a little bit there. Was he really charging interest or not? Was he just lending money without interest? And that's where the grammar part, I wasn't quite sure which way it, it leaned completely. But he was throwing in his name, his reputation, into the mix on saying, yeah, I'm right there with you. I was not 100% above board, I don't think, in how I was treating maybe the poor Israelites. But remember, last week we read about Nehemiah and how, and we're going to look at it again closer tonight, how he um, did not collect anything from the Israelites as he could have, as previous governors did do. Nehemiah didn't do that. And we'll get to that in a few verses. So Nehemiah is stepping up and confessing that he also was lending to the people. Not 100% sure if he was charging interest like some of the other nobles and rulers were doing. He's basically saying, though, that he was wrong. Maybe his heart wasn't completely right in what he was doing, uh, and maybe he could have um, done it a different way. Um, these might be the three hardest words that Nehemiah tried to spit out here. And if you're married, you probably might be aware of these uh, three words, too. Uh, three hardest words to say in the English language if, if you're married. I am wrong, or I am sorry. <laughs> it's hard to sometimes be, to be that first one to admit uh, when one of you is wrong. Uh, and just a reminder again, this, this word usury that you see at the end of this verse, that's basically uh, lending with interest. All right, verse 11. Restore now. I, I bolded that word now because we're going to see that in a couple different verses. Uh, Nehemiah is really emphasizing the importance of doing things, remedying, fixing things quickly. He says, restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain the new wine, and the oil that you have charged them. So he kind of lays out everything that he's heard. Remember in previous verses 1 through 5 last week, we heard about all of this stuff being sold or borrowed against or mortgaged just so they could get money to buy food for their family. So Nehemiah challenged the leaders to restore what they had taken with interest now. Immediately, he says, even this day, and this hundredth of the money that they're speaking of here would essentially be roughly 12% annual interest. Because if you wanted to look at it, when it says a hundredth, that would be like 1%, one out of a hundred, charged every month. So 12 months in a year, 12% interest. So even nowadays, 12% is medium range, but still pretty high. I mean, if we could earn 12% on our savings accounts, that would be awesome. Um, but when we're charged 12% on a credit card, that's bad, but it's not as high as it could be, right? I mean, I, sometimes, I mean, some of you may have known, well, I've, I've been charged 18% or 22%, or I don't know what the max is, if there is a max. I know they can change it without uh, notice, essentially. But I think it, there may be a max, I just don't know what it is. But 12% 2,000 years ago was a big chunk of money. Uh, and that's what they were, so this was the king's tax that was still uh, being collected that they were having a hard time paying. And that's why this third group of people, it talked about them uh, borrowing money to pay the king's tax. And this is the 12% that is being brought up in this verse. And now Nehemiah is saying, 
restore all this other stuff, all these lands, vineyards, olive groves, houses, restore all those assets and the interest that you were charging them. And now what we're going to see next is uh, pretty amazing. Verse 12, so they said, so now these are the rich rulers and nobles, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Wow, that's a pretty impressive response. Now here's Nehemiah coming up in this second part of this verse. Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. So Nehemiah, he's calling in the priest, saying, hey, brothers, come on in here. We got, we got some business to do. And he's saying, and they required an oath from them. This them, this pronoun is referring back to the nobles and the rulers. He's still got this big group of people here. He's saying, priests, go throughout this crowd, and I want you to get, have them take an oath. Right now, we're going to get it maybe in writing probably uh, to prove that they're agreeing to these stipulations to give back all these assets and the interest that they just heard Nehemiah, Nehemiah spoke of and they're going to do it. So the rulers and lenders have agreed with Nehemiah's request to restore and repay to their brethren now. Again, I emphasize that word now. Nehemiah didn't waste any time in calling the priests into the fray and asking them to have the lenders and rulers take an oath that they would do according to the promise that they just made. So that's essentially just kind of reiterating verse 12 in, in my own words. Nehemiah is calling people out into, what would you say? Personal accountability. Uh, that's a kind of a, um, a word that has been thrown a lot around a lot in the last five years probably, uh, accountability. And it's really hard to hold people accountable in, in today's uh, politically correct environment. Um, some corporations, some businesses find it really difficult to, to hold their employees uh, accountable. Certainly not as much as they were able to do years and years ago. Uh, it was just, you know, uh, my dad's generation and our grandpa's generation, uh, you, know, you did your job well or you got fired. Um, I mean, they just, or you got corrected and you just learned how to do it better. Uh, now, um, I mean, I could speak of examples in my own workplace where the weak link lingers, and it, it's hard for that to for the manager, for the boss, the leader, to um, break that re weak link out of the chain and let him go find something that he or she is better at. <laughs> to put it nicely, right? I was trying to be politically correct there, wasn't I? Um, instead of just firing the doofus and say, "Hey, go find something that you're better at or enjoy doing," uh, it's hard to do that in uh, c today's current. Um, environment. So personal accountability is what Nehemiah was not afraid of doing. Also, we see this a lot in the New Testament, don't we? I mean, we saw Jesus holding people accountable. Uh, John, Paul, Peter, they all were not afraid of calling people to the carpet, you know, in, in today's present uh, uh, terminology. They weren't afraid of um, rebuking somebody um, and letting them know where they did wrong. Um, so yeah, this is something that uh, was not lost on these people there. Nehemiah, again, back in verse 8, he said what he said, and then in verse 9 and 10, the rulers and nobles said, yeah, you're right, we were wrong. Uh, so we didn't have all the words captured, I'm sure, that Nehemiah spoke to them, but I'm sure the, the tone and the words that he used was impressive enough to convince and convict the minds and hearts of all these ro rulers and nobles to change their mind and say, yeah, we were wrong. And then for them to agree now to repay and to take an oath to repay and do all that. Um, so he, he knew how to express and call people into personal accountability. Verse 13. Then I, Nehemiah, talking here again, I shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. So imagine if I was up here with a, a big tan tu tunic, you know, whatever the big garment was with the hole in the top, you put it over all your clothes and it just kind of hung down and it was probably baggy a little bit and you had to 
cinch it around your waist with some sort of rope or cord. Um, and did it actually say the fold? In, so it doesn't say that he was sitting. He, he could have been standing, and maybe he loosened that cord around his waist, and he just took it out and went like this with his shirt. And, you know, all the crumbs that sometimes may be sitting in your lap if you were sitting and eating with your tunic on. But he was just, he was really demonstrating that he wanted to get the dust off of him. He wanted to get the crumbs out of his pants. He was, yeah, things are flying away from him. And he was just trying to make a, a, a point here that these people really needed to abide by this promise. The promise that the priests just made them take an oath to do. So Nehemiah is calling out all the rulers and lenders and pretty much saying that any of them that don't follow through on this promise, that they would be emptied of their house and their property. By shaking out his garment, like I just demonstrated, uh, Nehemiah was dramatizing what God would do if the people broke their promise. So God was just going to shake their life up, essentially, if they didn't follow through on this promise. So uh, I wasn't there back then, but I, I just kind of, from all the different stories and scripture that you read, it's just kind of evident sometimes that uh, pictures play, visual pictures play a lot more in the understanding of things. You know, Pastor David has really been going deep on a couple studies on uh, sharing uh, what a lot of these words that we're reading, uh, what they, the picture representation of what some certain words mean. So again, Nehemiah was dramatizing as he was talking what the Lord was going to do to these individuals, to these men, if they didn't follow through on their promise. So I think it made his point very well, and they, they understood and they knew uh, what was going to happen uh, if they didn't follow through on this promise. So verse 14. Moreover, from that time I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. So wow, uh, 12 years, King Artaxerxes uh, gave Nehemiah permission. King Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah provision and protection to stay in Jerusalem for 12 years where, again, he had the provisions necessary where he did not need to use the governor's provisions. Provisions, money, assets that were totally within his ability to extract from the people of uh, Jerusalem if he so chose. And apparently all the previous um, governors were, had done that and were doing that. So Nehemiah never used the governor's rightful or statutory provisions as he could have. Nehemiah's pers personal conduct allows him to be bold as he has been in this chapter. So some of the things that I've described, uh, Nehemiah was being very bold in what he was saying. Remember, he was the king's cupbearer, and he may have come to Jerusalem 12 years ago thinking that he didn't have much power or authority, but he it still was the governor, and he wasn't known by anybody in this area until he got there. So during these 12 years, he had to be above reproach, for lack of a better term. He had to walk the walk and talk the talk, and he essentially earned a lot of street cred by the things that he did and the things that he said over these 12 years, that he was able to speak to these rulers and nobles and lenders in such a way that they heard his words and they obeyed his words quickly. So Nehemiah's personal conduct allows him to be as bold as what we've saw, seen him be in this chapter. So when you live above reproach, it lends credibility to what you have to say. And that's very important. Um, it, it's very important to, if you're going to rebuke somebody to, you know, not have that beam in the eye as a uh, uh, Matthew 7, 5 speaks of. So you got to not have that uh, beam in your eye when you're trying to remove a speck from somebody else's eye, else's eye. And he had this street cred, this uh, credibility, this integrity, uh, this power, in essence, in his words because of the life that he had lived for these 12 years in their presence. So the life lesson here. 
Any leader who is in compromise will go soft in the area he is in compromise in. So just read that again in your mind. Any leader who is in compromise will go soft in the area he is in compromise in. And Nehemiah kind of sensed that he was going soft maybe in this area, and he didn't want it to be that way, and he didn't want all these other leaders. Because remember, these rulers and nobles, they're leaders as well. So he was pointing out to them that you're in compromise. You're not as strong as you could be. Um, for instance, if a leader is compromising, so what I mean by he goes soft in the area that he is in compromise in. Uh, an example, just because it's so close to all of our hearts, if we talk about finances, for instance, and because, you know, when we're in church, a lot of times pastors do talk about finances really well, and sometimes other pastors don't talk about finances really well. They just might be embarrassed to do it, or they might be in compromise in that area. So let me explain. If a leader is compromising in his personal life around the area of finances, that pastor won't teach as boldly to his fellowship as he should in the area of finances. Remember, he's going to have maybe personal conviction or embarrassment if he's not handling his personal finances well. He's not going to feel emboldened, empowered enough to, to say what should be done to a whole congregation. So that's just an example of how if a leader is in compromising the financial life, he's not going to share finances strongly or boldly with others. Um, kind of think of it a different way. If you live a life that is compromised or a life in sin, that takes away your ability to speak truth into other people's lives. Remember, if you're living a life in sin, you got the plank in your eye, and you go to speak to another brother or sister about that same type of sin and they know you they see the plank and maybe their sin was just a little bit less than yours you know there's going to be a, a heated discussion maybe that come out of that because they're going to say well you're doing the same thing I am and you're saying now that I should stop doing it but what about you so you got that back and forth that can go on and any leader that's in compromise in some area of his life I just kind of threw out possibly living in sin or possibly not handling your finances properly is going to make it harder for you to speak to somebody else with credibility. So, Again, Nehemiah had the credibility to speak to these nobles and rulers and have them listen and obey to him. So all the things that he did for 12 years leading up to this discussion with the rulers and nobles was exemplary, was above reproach, and they respected him wholeheartedly. Verse 15, but the former governors, now again, Nehemiah's remembering and bringing to the surface what happened before he got there, but the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Nehemiah explains what he found out or heard about the previous governors that they did take from the people bread and wine and 40 shekels of silver. There apparently was an abuse of power by the previous governors that Nehemiah did not wish to emulate or copy. So again, when I read this uh, a while ago in, in coming up with my notes, he was talking about previous governors. He didn't actually say all previous governors, but it just made me wonder about Zerubbabel. When he first came back and was governor of the land, did, was he doing this? Um, it doesn't speak about it that I remember back when he was in the land, but Nehemiah is just kind of remembering all the previous governors. So maybe Zerubbabel too, maybe not, because uh, Nehemiah didn't say all governors. He just knows that some were dealing not as above board as they could have been, or maybe some of them were taking more advantage of the Israelite people than what they should have been. Uh, even though it was their rightful or statutory right to do that as governor, you know, some leaders just take advantage of their people more so than others. Um, so just, th that's all I'm trying to, to point out there. Notice why Nehemiah did not use any of the governor's provisions because of the fear of God. 
So that's pretty important. We see that uh, phrase come up several times in this book. Uh, it's going to come up again a, a, a little bit later as well. His integrity would not allow him to take advantage of the people of God. So that's a good thing. We should all have that deep down burden not to take advantage of other people, especially those that are less privileged for whatever reason, whether it's financially or physically or emotionally, whatever it is, when we see somebody in need, we should, our first inclination should not be, how can I use this to my advantage? Uh, hopefully that's not anybody's first thought, right? We don't want to be like the wrongdoers had gotten, they had let themselves get to that point. Uh, remember, charging interest for money that they lended to somebody. They weren't supposed to do that. It was written in the law. They, knew, they should have known it, and yet they were doing it. And they were treating the people that were in bondage to them as slaves. They knew that they could have people in bondage to them, but they weren't supposed to treat them as slaves, and yet they did. So they had strayed away from what God had told them that they should be doing and how they should be acting. Remember, integrity, all of us have a certain level of integrity, some higher than others. And did you earn that integrity quickly? Did it come easily? The answer to both of those is no. Integrity takes time and effort to gain and, and to build it up but it can so easily be lost or forfeit, can't it? All it takes is one r slightly bad example that y you do something or you say something, you get caught doing something that you know is completely off the board that you shouldn't have been doing. But again, in politics, we see this happen all the time uh, for whatever reason. I mean, they're just in the limelight, so we hear about people's lives so much more, it seems like, in politics and in, in movie stars. Um, so anybody in the news that's somewhat famous, what we call famous, you know, their life is an open book. So we get to see that so much more dramatically than maybe just the people here in the room. We may not even know anything that's weird going on in our life, like what we see on the, in the news and in the tabloids, for instance. So integrity is something that uh, it takes a long time to build up and, and nourish uh, and to build up um, and it can so easily be squashed. Um, Nehemiah had this integrity again with the rulers and nobles uh, and he was going to make sure that he maintained that by correcting the situation lovingly and the best he could to get all these other rulers and nobles to get on board with him and stop doing what they were doing and return everything back to the people that were already so heavily in bondage. So verse 16. Indeed, I also continued the work on the wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. So note that Nehemiah and Nehemiah's servants worked on the walls of Jerusalem, and they did not buy any land. They were not trying to get rich off of the people of, it, of Jerusalem. So that was, that was a good thing. One author I heard said, Leaders are people who accept more blame than is right. So some leaders accept more blame than, than what they need to, and they also take less credit than is actually due them in sacrifice to benefit others. So let me say it all together without my ad lib. Leaders are people who accept more blame than is right and take less credit than is due in sacrifice to benefit others. So you may have a teacher, you may have a, a past boss or a current boss or a, a pastor or somebody that you can think of that has done this. You know, they, they accept more blame than what they should just to benefit or help others, or they take less credit than is due. Uh, does anybody remember where this quote came from? Because I, I wasn't able to um, capture it. But I think I saw or heard Andy Stanley say it at one point in time, and it may have even been a president that said this. It seems like, uh, it sounds, sounds like something Truman might have said, but I'm just... I'm just throwing that out there in case somebody can recollect where that saying came from. Because um, I, re I remember reading it. That's why I said one author said, but I can't remember who it was attributed to. And Jesus was an example of, uh, of this just as Nehemiah was. He could have taken credit for everything in his 33 years on this earth. 
and he, he was very, 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 very humble. Moses was another very humble person, the meekest man on earth, right? He calls himself that. Um, <laughs> so was he really that humble, if you called him? <laughs> but go ahead. True, yeah. So, so yeah, we read about, correct. You just got to be careful how you read that scripture because scripture calls him the meekest man, right? So, yeah, it doesn't say that he was quoting himself <laughs> of saying that. So Jesus and Nehemiah, Moses, uh, all great leaders uh, that took less credit than what they probably could have and... I'm sorry, they um, took more blame and they took less credit than what they could have. Verse 17. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers besides those who came to us from the nations around us. So here Nehemiah was just kind of reminding folks or just telling them what had been happening for the past 12 years. Uh, that he had been feeding 150 people plus daily from his own provisions without taxing or withdrawing uh, anything from the people. So that's a big table of people to feed throughout the day, right? Um, the next verse is going to talk about all the different animals that were sacrificed to provide this, this meal. But if, if you go back and read, um, you know, back in Solomon's day, uh, I think he had even more people. I, didn't, I just happen to think of that now, but I remember some of the animals that were sacrificed to feed the people around Solomon's uh, table at the time. It seemed like it was hundreds of fowl and hundreds of cattle and hundreds of this uh, to feed all the servants that were busy about the temple and ar around the, the king's palace at that time. So Nehemiah, nonetheless, 150 people. That's a lot of people. Uh, Ken can probably attribute to what it feeds, what it takes just to feed the worship team of on a big day, 10 or 12 or 15. Uh, but 150, that's a lot of food. So he's just reminding the people just kind of reiterating, you know, this, this takes a lot of uh, resources uh, to feed these people, and yet, luckily, he had the provisions, essentially, from, uh, I guess, King Artaxerxes, uh, the money that was sent with him. He was able to buy some of these provisions, but it wasn't really coming out of his own pocket, essentially, or out of the Israelites' pocket, for more importantly. Verse 18. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowl were prepared for me, and once every ten days an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because the bondage was heavy on this people. So I know how big a sheep is. I, I've been around sheep quite a bit when I was growing up, and I know that can provide quite a bit of meat. But for 150 people, though, I know six sheep is not nearly enough. So these ox, I don't, I've never seen an ox in real life. I think I've seen a couple pictures. But that ox, they must have been pretty heavy, pretty big. I'm imagining one of those big bulls, you know, the back of his back is about this high, and he's nine feet long, and, you know, it's just a big animal. I don't know, two, 3,000 pounds uh, of meat once they butchered this thing down. Then that added on to the six sheep I could see maybe feeding 150 people. There's probably a lot of good steak out of that thing. <laughs> so, but yeah, that doesn't seem like a lot, but those are uh, still seven animals plus the fowl, or seven oxen, sheep, and fowl. So what was I going to say here? So Nehemiah here just mentions the meat needed daily to feed the people coming to his table. And it reminds them again that he didn't use the city funds. He reiterates this once again, that he did have access to, for he knew the burdens that were on the people were already very heavy. So he did not try to add to that at, a, at all. And pertaining to the meat here, isn't that kind of what Jesus told Peter? He said, if you, if you love me, feed me sheep. Oh, maybe not. Maybe it was feed my sheep. <laughs> feed me sheep. Uh, no, feed my sheep is what Jesus told Peter to do. That was my poor attempt at humor there. <laughs> <Choo>! <laughs> feed me sheep. All right, verse 19. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for, his, for this people. So Nehemiah's motives were pure. He was trying to please God. But just the wording of that scripture verse, uh, 
I would say that this kind of is a pretty bold statement of Nehemiah to say what he said in this verse. Uh, I would like to think that uh, I would never say what Nehemiah said here. I may say something different like along these lines, Remember me, Lord, for you are gracious and merciful, and that's what I need. It, it, it seems a little bit opposite of being humble when he says, Remember me, my God, for good. Remember all the good stuff that I did? That just seems kind of weird, doesn't it? You know, after what we've been taught here for so long, he's really trying to take credit at this point for a lot of it. But his, I think from the commentaries that I read in the, the, my study Bible and so forth, you know, he had, really had a pure, good motive in, in what he was trying to say here. And also, Nehemiah, will see in the very last passage of this whole book, he repeats it. He says, um, Thus I cleanse them of everything, I cleanse them of everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits at appointed times. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. So he was just wanting to, he was in essence kind of thanking the Lord that the Lord allowed him to do the work that he did. And he's just pointing out that I got to do a lot of good stuff for the people of Israel. So I think that's kind of the mindset or the, the intent that he was trying to say there. Just remember all the good things that you allowed me to do, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing that to happen through me. Right? So if he, had, it was, if, he was able to, if he was able to elaborate like I just did, that's maybe what he would have said. Um, but I'm not going to put words in Nehemiah's mouth. That's the way the Holy Spirit captured it, so maybe that's just the way he intended to say it. <laughs> so to wrap up, um, I'm going to say like there's two different principles that I wanted to, to share with you. First principle is God is honored when we handle money wisely. So you could think of this as an extended life lesson, I guess. One-sixth of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, talk about money. That's quite a bit of content in just those three books that talk about finances and money. And Martin Luther has said that there are three conversions that are very, very important. The heart, the mind, and your wallet. I think Pastor David alluded to this, or someone alluded to it recently as well, that it, it's the wallet sometimes that's probably the hardest one to, to convert. Um, so that's God is honored when we handle money wisely. And just to throw in a little tidbit of information, the Financial Peace University class is going to be starting up again September 9th. So get that on your radar. It'll have come up in the announcements in another couple weeks, but that's the date that's been set to, for our next fall session of FPU. So that was principle number one. Principle number two, personal or private sin will eventually affect your public testimony. Eventually, it will come out. Remember Jonah the prophet. He didn't want to go to Nineveh as God commanded him, so he thought he would go to Tarshish instead, away from the presence of God. He thought he could take his personal sin away from others until he got on someone else's boat. His personal sin affected everyone on that boat, even the pagans. Unfortunately, what a bad witness that was. What a bad testimony. So um, Jonah was told specifically by God to, to go to Nineveh and preach the good news to Nineveh. And he, he, he essentially said, nah, I'm, I'm going the other way. And, you know, he, he thought he could outrun God or do something, just get away from hearing this voice in his head of God telling, telling him to go to Nineveh. But yet... What happened when he got on that boat? Uh, God stirred up the ocean. The guys on the boat said, where are these waves coming from? This is kind of weird, peculiar. And they ended up seeking out Nineveh, or seeking out Jonah. Where was he at? Down at the bottom of the boat, sleeping. They, they pulled him up and said, hey, who do you pray to? Or what? Uh, trying, to, trying to remember what, he, what they exactly said to him. And he essentially said, well, uh, I'm trying to avoid my God. He told me to go do this one thing, and I, I'm not doing it. And they said, ah, you're the God of the Hebrews. We've heard, we've heard about your God of the Hebrews. And, uh, man, you we, you got to do whatever it takes to correct your situation. And uh, what Jonah told him to do, he said, well, you're going to have to throw me overboard. And, and they did. So believe it or not, if you haven't read that book, go read the book of Jonah. It's, a, it's the one with the big whale, swallows up Jonah for three days, you know. What's that? Are we? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep, so stick around. We'll, we'll hear about the book of Jonah. <laughs> 
And uh, that was the end of uh, Nehemiah chapter 5.